Good evening, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Let's uh, open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this class tonight. We thank you that we can be together. And Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is with us tonight. We pray that the word would come alive to our hearts as we study it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You have uh, a paper with you. I warned you about this. No, just kidding. <laughs> What I'd like you to do is uh, take a few minutes, maybe form a couple of groups. I'd like you to work together. Let's, let's talk to each other. Turn around if you can. Take a few minutes uh, and work on some of these questions together. See if you can come up with some of the answers, and then we'll go over them with each other. So if you have to move a little bit, feel free to do that. Maybe get two groups, possibly. Uh, what is the so-called unholy trinity in Bible prophecy? Okay, says so everybody can hear you, Dave. Dragon, beast, and Satan. Dragon, beast, and Satan. Uh, and who are they? What are there other names for those? And who's it? okay? The dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Who's the beast? The first beast. Antichrist. And then the other beast is the false prophet. So yes. So the Antichrist. The uh, I'm sorry, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. Good. Who is the beast from the sea? He's the Antichrist. Very good. Who is the beast from the land? Okay. Right, so he's the false prophet. So they're both called the beast. One is from the sea. The other is, comes from the land. Um Name the three major views and explain, and time views and explain what each means. And this just, I'm only looking for just a brief sort of definition here. What are the pre, let anybody get the pre, the three major views, and time views? Okay. That's all right. Yes. Yes, yes, good. Pre, post, and ah, the letter A, millennialism. What, what is that, again, without getting into the deep meaning of each one, what is pre-millennial? What does that term mean? Pre, what's before? It means, what, it means something's what? Before the millennium, what? Okay, what is pre-millennial? What, what event are we talking about that is pre Yes, the rapture. So all these views are have reference to the rapture. So if premillennialism is the view that the rapture is going to take place before the millennium, postmillennialism is the view that the rapture is going to take place when? Very good, after the millennium. Now, of course, the, the difficult one is what's amillennialism then? You know, what, and that comes to the, ah is, means the word, it's a, means no or none. Um, so no millennium. Now that's a misnomer because amillennialists do not believe in the, that there's no millennium. What they believe is there's not a literal millennium, a literal 1,000 years. So this is the group of people who really uh, use symbolism a lot in their end time interpretation, right? They say a thousand years isn't a thousand, it's just a really long period of time. It doesn't have to be a thousand. So amillennialism means not a literal, they don't believe in a literal millennium. And again, we, we went over that a few weeks ago. If you want to catch up on it, go back and look at the videos. Or is happening now. Uh, again, most, most of them would believe most of these main events that we see as future are happening now simultaneously to some degree. And that, that goes for post-millennialism as well, again, without getting into, into the weeds on that again. Um, but they do not believe, as we pre-millennialists do, that when it says a thousand years, it means a thousand years. And that there's gonna be a, uh, and that the rapture is gonna take place before the millennium. Very good, number four. 
True or false, the second coming of Christ and the rapture refer to the same event? Why do you say false, Dave? Well, the rapture takes place now, and the second coming is the second coming. Okay. And what's the time frame of those two events? Okay. Yeah, when do, okay. But what's the time frame between the two? I'm sorry. Maybe between the rapture. Seven years. seven years. Good. And what's that seven years? That's the tribulation. tribulation. Right. Number five, true or false? According to the premillennial view, the world will get better and better until Jesus returns and rules on earth for 1,000 years. Okay, false. Anybody else have a view? Everybody say false. Why is it false? <laughs> okay, but there are some views that say it's going to get better. It's, but that's, it's not the premillennial view. Which view says things are going to get better of the three? The, post, the post-millennialist view is the view that everything's going to get better and better. And then after the millennium, Christ is going to return. After everything's already pretty much, the world is pretty much Christianized, then Jesus is going to return. Um, so that's post-millennialism. Uh, and um, you'll hear some pro- popular preachers today uh, kind of take that view if you listen closely to their preaching. Um, Number six, true or false, one of the main purposes of the tribulation is to bring Israel as a nation to salvation. True or false? (laughs) I think you're outnumbered, Dave. (laughs) Uh, Why why, why do those of you say true? Why do you say true? Okay. So, yeah, it's going to be really that last seven-year period where God is going to deal uh, the last seven years in which he's going to finalize his plan with Israel. And ultimately, it's going to end up with a remnant of, that, of Israel coming to salvation, meaning they're going to acknowledge Christ as the Messiah uh, after all this time. Um, and what are other uh, purposes of the tribulation? Just generally to judge the world, right? Um, To, uh, again, there's going to be uh, the judgment of the of the unrighteous and so forth. So, it's it's really the final the final judgment. It's more specifically probably what the Bible speaks of in the Old Testament: the day of the Lord, right? This is when God's going to show up in history, the final time, and set everything right on earth, right, before he makes a new heaven and a new earth. So it's about God's ultimate justice and judgment uh, coming to the earth. But Israel is a central part of God's plan, always has been, and will be also in the tribulation uh, period. Um, The 70 weeks discussed in Daniel 9 refers to how many years in total? 490 years. Anybody else have a different number? Four, how do you get to that number, uh, Carl? 70 times seven weeks of days. or It's kind of difficult to put in words. 70 times 70 units of seven, right? And what does that mean about Israel then? If God's focus is on the church, or really you could say Gentiles, what's, where does that put Israel in God's plan right now? Yeah, so there's somewhat, there's somewhat in a holding pattern. If we're talking about God's big, big uh, prophetic plan, um, because when Israel rejected Christ, God said, well, I'm going to take my message to the Gentiles. And, and it's during that period, the period we're still in, where God is mainly trying to bring the Gentiles into the church. And then when the church age ends, which is when? When the rapture, the church goes up, right? 
Then God's plan resumes with Israel for the last seven years during the tribulation period. So Israel is kind of on hold, I'm going to put it that way, in terms of God, God's active plan with Israel until all the Gentiles that are going to be saved come into the kingdom. And then God's plan picks up again at the rapture and to, at, uh, during the tribulation period. Uh, at what point in Daniel's 70-week timetable are we presently? We kind of answered that a little bit. Okay, week number 69. Right? Week number 69. Sort of, you could say, maybe between 69 and 70, right? If you want to sort of be a little more exact, maybe. Um, but yeah, usually we, you say 69. Uh, week 70, has that started yet? No. And we're going to talk about that tonight a little more when we close. So we're in week 69. Again, that, is, that uh, period is known as what? Carl just said it. It's in the orange up there or the pink, whatever that color is. Church age. That's, we're, we're kind of between the yellow and the red. <laughs> That's where we are right now on the, on the chart. Uh, what, when will the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks begin? Yes, the rapture, right? And when the Antichrist uh, appears, right? Uh, so... The 70th week is, um, is the tribulation period. I guess I probably answered that before. So, yeah, the, the 70th week of Daniel begins with the rapture and then the appearance of the Antichrist. Number 10, what four historical royal kingdoms are represented by the statue in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream according to Daniel 2, 31 to 43? It's a long one. Okay, good, good. Um, what order do they appear in history, those four kingdoms? Okay, so the Babylonians were empowered at the time of Daniel's prophecy. The Persians took them over. The Greeks overthrew them, and then the Romans overthrew them. Um, what kingdom represented in Daniel 2 by the stone not cut with hands is represented by the Daniel 2 by the stone not cut with hands that demolishes the statue? Anybody remember that passage? Yeah, the statue had the four kingdoms, you know, that we just mentioned. And then there's, there's um, another, another a rock that comes out of the mountain representing another king or kingdom. What, that smashes the the statue of all those other kingdoms. What what, would, what kingdom is that? That's that's Christ's kingdom, right? This Christ, and so that represents the fact that Christ is going to come and destroy all the kingdoms of the world, and He is going to uh, rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's Daniel two, thirty one to forty three. What kingdom is represented? Oh, I just said that. Um, what is the event called where believers will be rewarded for their faithfulness to Christ while on earth? Okay, the Bema Seat. Is there another name for it, too? Judgment Seat of Christ. Right, same thing. Bema Seat or the Judgment Seat of Christ. When and where will this event take place? Okay. Okay, everybody hear that? Where's the bema seat of the judgment seat going to take place? Say again, Carl. Seven. And and when? Okay, so it's yeah. Generally, it's not really pinpointed in scripture. But when you, when you put together all the events, you have to ask yourselves, where could this take place? It's only believers that are in the, in the Abima judgment. Um, the church is going to be raptured, meaning we're going to heaven at the beginning of the tribulation. 
So putting just things together, it seems like it, that's where the judgment seat is going to take place. It's going to take place in heaven during the tribulation period down, that's going on down here on earth, which we're not going to be part of. We're going to be in heaven being uh, rewarded. Um, what part of Nebuchadnezzar's statue represents the so-called revived Roman Empire? Say it again. Okay. Okay, almost. Okay, almost. It's the feet, which are made of what? Iron, which again, the legs are made of. That's the original Roman Empire. But the feet are made of iron and clay. The clay representing what? Daniel actually says it right in the prophecy. It represents that it's going to be, a, in one hand, a strong kingdom like the original Roman Empire, but it's going to be fragile in some way. It's going to be subject to destruction. And that's when the stone rolls and crushes it. So the revived kingdom is not going to last, in other words. But it's going to be, it's going to be very, very uh, sort of vicious, like the original Roman Empire. Who's going to rule over this revived Roman Empire? The Antichrist, yes. Um, so the feet mixed with clay is the, um, is the re revived Roman Empire in Daniel chapter 2. Um, what is the revived Roman Empire, and how many nations will it consist of? We could have sort of just said what it is. How many nations? Yes. Everybody hear that? Ten nations, right? Um, who are going to be, many think, nations that were part of the old Roman Empire, who are going to uh, rise again to power, and the Antichrist will come out of the, that ten-nation confederacy. How long will the Great tri Tribulation last? Okay, I got a seven. Anybody else? Carl? Why do you say three and a half, not seven? Because the first half of the Tribulation period that the so-called literal Tribulation will be set to the time period will be set to two thousand and the second half will be set to the time of the first half. Okay, so yeah, the Tribulation gen overall is seven years, but the Bible does make a distinction between the general tribulation and the great tribulation, which means everything is going to intensify at that point. It's also called in scripture in the Old Testament, the time of Jacob's trouble. This is when the Israel is going to really come under a harsh persecution. The Antichrist is going to turn against them. He's going to, uh, this is when the abomination of desolation occurs in the temple where he sets himself up as God uh, and demands worship and so forth. Um, and this is why uh, the second half of the tribulation is going to be much, much worse than the first three and a half years. And so Jesus in Matthew 24 refers to it as the great tribulation. Uh, number 16, at the rapture, at what place will Jesus' feet touch the earth? Okay, at what place, at what place will Jesus? Okay, Mount of Olives, okay. Anybody else have a guess or answer? No. Right, that's the Mount of Olives. I, I threw a little curveball here. And can, you, can, I, can anybody pick up what the curveball is in the question? Doesn't touch the earth when? when in what event? Okay, in the rapture, Jesus' feet do not touch the earth. Right? When do his feet touch the earth? The second coming of Christ, yeah. So, um, yeah. And the, and the answer is no place. The answer is no place. That's why I said it threw you a curveball. But if you read those two passages, you could have figured it out. So I, I gave you a clue. Um, 
I'll give you more time next time. Um, yeah, so yeah, at the second coming, uh, we haven't, that's coming up, maybe next week we're talking about the second coming. We haven't really talked about the second coming yet as an event. Um, that's when Jesus will come all the way to earth and the rapture just comes in the clouds and we go meet him, believers. Second coming, he comes w with us to earth um, and touches his feet specifically, and Zechariah tells us on the Mount of Olives, uh, it will the, the mount will split from north to south. There'll be a geographical shift in that in that part of Israel, and the the Jordan River will will uh, cut a path over to the Mediterranean Sea. There's going to be a, um, so there's going to be we'll look at it next week, but but uh, so he's going to touch his feet and it's going to create create uh, some real geological um, upheaval. Um, among other things that are going to be appear at the second coming. Um, unlike the rapture when only those who are raptured are going to go up and, s and see him, it appears. It's at the second coming that there'll be signs in the heavens and so forth uh, that will precede his coming. Um, what is going to happen to Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet when Jesus returns? Okay, that's a right answer. Can you be a little more specific, though? Okay. Okay, pr uh, pretty close. So the false prophet and the Antichrist at the, w at the second coming, at the end of the tribulation, are going to be thrown where for eternity? Lake of fire. Is Satan going to be thrown in the lake of fire at that point? No. He's going to be bound in the bottomless pit or the abyss. So the false prophet and the Antichrist are going to be sent to their final destination, which is the lake of fire at that point. Satan will ultimately be thrown in with them, but that won't be until after the thousand years. So that's the difference. Um, the purpose of prophecy in the Bible is to serve as a crystal ball into the future. What do you think about that? This kind of goes back to our first sort of introductory lesson. Do you think prophecy is meant to be a crystal ball? No. Okay. Okay, a witnessing tool. In other words, is the is the is the sole purpose of prophecy, or even the main purpose, so that we know everything that's going to happen in the future? Specifically. Yeah. Okay. If God wanted us to know everything in the future, why why would He put it in? cloaked language like prophecy. Okay, good. We're getting to the point. You, okay, Dave, you said not everyone's going to understand it. When, when will we understand it? When it's fulfilled. See, we, sometimes we get the purpose of prophecy backwards. Most of the prophecies about Christ, for instance, in the Old Testament were not understood by the early Christians even by the apostles, until after they happened, right? I mean, they've read these prophecies, but what does this mean? And then the event occurred in history, and they said, oh, look, this is what was prophesied. This is more the function of prophecy than we give credit to. We think that God gives us prophecy so we can know the future. No, God, is, in fact, at the end of this, it, it, Daniel says, to Daniel, seal up the prophecy, right? Until a later time. In other words, you're not going to understand this, Daniel. In fact, nobody is until at least the time gets close or maybe even after the fact. So prophecy to a large degree is, is to confirm the faithfulness of God. 
that he does what he says he will do. Now, that's an important lesson we can take into our practical daily lives, isn't it? See, we need, to, we need to get some practical use out of prophecy as well. Sometimes we're always thinking it's just about the future and future and knowing the future. Wait a minute, how does it help me today? Well, one way it helps me is it says everything that God has ever said or promised or prophesied, he has done. Right? That is, God is faithful. What he says he will do. I don't know about you, but I can take that home tonight and has a nice, as a, as a good uh, uh, promise to stand on. Amen? Amen? I don't know who the Antichrist is. It doesn't matter to me, quite frankly, but that matters to me. Right? I don't know exactly when this or that's going to take place. If God wanted us, he would have put dates in the scripture. We're going to look tonight, just as we close, at the closest date he's given us to anything, but nothing is, uh, he doesn't give us exact dates about things. So if prophecy were meant to tell us the future, God could have told us in cl clearly times, dates, you know, who, who this person was, who that, uh, you know, who the Antichrist was and all those things. He hasn't done that. So prophecy in some sense is purposefully cloaked language. That's not what a crystal ball is, you know, supposedly. You, know, you go to somebody, they're supposed to tell you, they, you know, you want to know what? What's my future? Um, so anyway, let's move on. We're running out of time here. Um, the, seventh week, the 70th week of Daniel corresponds to what period of seven years? Tribulation. Yes, the tribulation period. The 70th week, that last week of those 490 years, which is yet in the future, corresponds to, this, to the tribulation, the, the seven-year tribulation period. They are the same thing. The 70th week is the tribulation period period. Um, true or false, when Jesus returns at the second coming, he will come alone riding on a white horse. Okay, I got a like, quick nose there. What's You said no, June. Why'd you say no? Yeah, I thought you said no. Okay, the second coming, is he coming on a white horse? Sounds like you're getting there. Very good. Give Joan a hand. She got, yeah, that's another one of those little curveballs. No, he, he's going to come. The, the rapture is going to come alone, you could say. But at the second coming, he's not going to come alone. He's going to come on a white horse. But who's coming with him? Yeah, we're coming with him at this time. We've been in heaven for seven years, getting judged and eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we haven't talked about yet. What's that? <laughs> yeah, and we're gonna so we're gonna come with him. Yes. Uh, all right, very good. Um, Twenty-one, according to Second Thessalonians two one through four, what two things must take place before the tribulation begins? I think this was last week we talked about this. Anybody else have a different answer? David said. I mean, Dave said the. The uh, great apostasy, and then the son of perdition, or the uh, man of lawlessness, appears. Man of yeah. Okay. Okay. Close. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a mixture of some of your answers. I think Dave got closest. I believe what uh, Second Thessalonians says is that. Uh, before the tribulation comes, two things must take place. A great falling away or apostasy. Now, this ties in with what Grace says because we talk about let, some people interpret that word apostasy to be referring to the rapture because it, it can also just mean departure. Um, so some, many Bible scholars, of course, say it means people are going to fall away from the Christian faith, but others say it, it's the rapture. So that's another interpretation. Um, so the man of lawlessness, who is the man of lawlessness, by the way? He is the Antichrist. So another name for the Antichrist is the man of lawlessness, son of perdition. Um, who else is called the son of perdition in the Bible? Only one other person in Scripture besides the Antichrist. Anybody happen to know who that is? Yes, Jamie Judas. 
What, what, is the, what does the term mean, Jamie? Destruction. Or destruction, really, perdition. It might be a more modern word, right? Yeah, I, I don't know what it means, but I think it's the same thing. Someone who does evil and does it maliciously, does evil to someone else. Okay. And maybe even a little more than that, that they are the the idea between calling Antichrist son of perdition and Judas is that they are um, destined to destruction. From the beginning, they were not going to be saved. Now, this is again we get into a lot of theological discussion about that. God had already determined is what we have to say about this that these two characters, Judas and the Antichrist are unsavable, you could say, if that's such a word. They were doomed to destruction from the beginning. You could say, well, God foreknew that ahead of time, so, you know, however we want to get into that discussion. But the idea is that there was no, there was, they were never going to be saved. And so some people say, well, Judas, you know, he, got, he, he, he felt sorry and, you know, uh, threw the silver back to the, on the ground and then committed suicide. And so he repented and he might be saved. We might be tempted to think that out of compassion, except that the Bible says he, he was doomed to destruction from the beginning. So we have to say, unfortunately, Judas cannot be saved, will not be in heaven. And the same is said of the same can be said of the Antichrist because he's used, the same terminology is used to describe him. Um, so, yeah, the, so the two things before the tribulation that must happen is the man of lawlessness, Antichrist must appear, and there must be a great falling away in apostasy. Again, some people think that may refer to the rapture. Others think it's a falling away from the faith. Uh, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, or 8, what is restraining the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness from appearing? Okay. Anybody hear that? Everybody have a rapture? Okay. Right. So, so th what's keeping the uh, tribulation beginning is the appearing of the man of lawlessness. What's keeping the man of lawlessness from appearing is the rapture, or you could say the church, right, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. So what does that mean? That as long as the church is here, the Antichrist will not, will not appear. This is another support for the pre-trib, pre-millennial view, that we're going up before the tribulation. Um, if you interpret this verse to mean the church, it does not say explicitly the church. It says that which restrains. So it's, uh, Paul uses some uh, vague language there, but you piece it together, and without making 100% conclusive, that makes the most sense, that the church is what's holding holding the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist from appearing. So when Christians are worried about, oh, is, where is he? And, and are, am I going to take the mark of the beast by accident? There's no, there's no ground, biblical grounds for that, those kind of concerns. Uh, we're we're going to be gone. So, um, you know, we're going to be gone before he, uh, before he uh, appears. Um, according to 2 Thessalonians, oh, number 23, during the tribulation, what will be required for people to buy or sell anything? Was that Loretta? 666, six, 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 yes. The mark of the beast. Where do you have to take the mark? Hand or the forehead, right? Um, and what happens if you don't take them? They're going to be sealed, yeah. Yeah, but that's not with the mark of the beast. That's God's seal, yeah, right. Yeah, we'll talk about them next week, I believe. We're going to get to the 144 and the two prophets. Yeah, right. Yeah. Maybe it means a chip, right, under the skin? Could be. Um, what, uh, so what happens if you don't take the mark? Who, how do you die? What is it? 
Okay, get your head cut off. <laughs> By who? The Antichrist, right? Okay. So basically, to be a, to to become a Christian during the tribulation means most probably you're going to die because because of it, right? Unless somehow you escape through it into the uh, up to the second coming and into the millennium. Um, during the, well, place the, oh, okay, here's the last one. Place the following end time events in the order in which they will occur. What is number one? Okay. Let's see, let's, let's hear what everybody's saying. Okay, Dave's got the rapture. Anybody else? Okay, rapture. Just call it out. Number two, everybody call it out. Okay, we, I heard Dave call out. Everybody call out number two. What do you have? Okay, it, that, it's a little tricky because in a sense they're happening at the same time, aren't they? The rapture, we just said it. The rapture takes place, we're in heaven, uh, and, and the beam of judgment then occurs. So um, you could say the beam of judgment or... Um, well, that would that would be number two, probably in the list. How about number three? Everybody call it out. Number three. Okay. Okay. When does the abomination of desolation take place? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. So it is part of the tribulation period. Then, right at the at that midpoint when. The Antichrist reveals himself. Um, uh, I have it down for three number, th number the abomination of desolation for number three. Um, because it kind of takes place uh, again, sort of simultaneously with the, with the with their tribulation, but in the middle of it. Number four. What was number four after the? After the abomination of desolation, what's the fourth one? Okay, the tribulation was number two. Here's what. Here's the way I have them numbered. And again, I know there's a little. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No. Number one, rapture. Number two, tribulation. Then number three, I have Bema. But that could be reversed because, again, it's taking place at the same time. Yeah, you're right. Um, and then number four, or, no, or then, then the abomination of desolation, which takes place during the tribulation period at the midpoint. Then what takes place after that? What next event there after the abomination of desolation in, during the tribulation? I think it would be the second coming, right? Which takes place at the end of the tribulation period. So that would be that one, and then after the second coming, I think we, well, which, what would be next? We have the Battle of Armageddon, Millennium, Satan Bound. I think those are the three we have left. Which one? Okay, the Battle of Armageddon. Okay. And then the Millennium, and then Satan is Bound at the end of the millennium, right? Good. Wow, we're almost out of time today. Um, um, I don't know if I should do this or not. Let's see what I got here. I have the 70 weeks of Daniel here. I tell you what, I'm going to hold off on this because it gets a little bit involved. I'm only, I was only going to take 15 minutes, but we were already at sort of the end of our class tonight. Um, so, everybody give yourself 100, okay? The, te the teacher said it's okay. Any, any other thoughts or questions that we have? Additions? Yeah, Jamie? Most people think that takes place after the tribulation period, before the before the millennium in that space there. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't, this is not a, a inclusive uh, of all the events. I've kind of I've kind of tried to just put the ones on here we've already talked about. So maybe we'll do it again and then at, see how many of the other events we can add in. But I think that's generally where they would say the sheep and the goat judgment takes place is after after the tribulation, before the millennium. Yeah. Good questions. Anybody else? What's what's the answer to? Oh, did we did we didn't do twenty five? Oh. What is the answer, Roxanne? Who will sign a peace treaty with Israel? Yeah, the Antichrist. He's going to sign a treaty with Israel, and then break the treaty and turn against them at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Very good. Impressed. Let's stand this evening. Father, we thank you for just the interest that you put in our hearts for your word. Uh, Lord, we just realize how in-depth your word is the more we study it. But Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who uh, speaks to us through your word. Speak to our hearts tonight, Holy Spirit, I pray. Uh, not that we would just uh, have facts in our head, but that in our hearts, Lord, your word would transform us and change us uh, so that we could be more like you. So thank you, Lord, for this time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.